This is the panel on agriculture, nutrition and health. Where are we now, where are we headed, and where do we want to be? And I introduce your chair, and then I turn over to her very quickly. Your chair today is Jasprit Kindra. She is a journalist and the focal point for climate change and food security with Irene News in South Africa. She will introduce your panelists and moderate what I'm sure will be a lively discussion. Thank you, Jasprit. Hi, it's great to see so many people out here today. Um, if you're in, if you're if you're expecting a sort of an hour long of dreary shop talk on health, nutrition, and agriculture, you're in for disappointment because we have a very fine line of um, speakers um, who will take about five minutes each in their first warm up round, and then we'll have some questions and, uh, and then finally a wrap. Uh, we start with uh, Professor uh, Pierre Pinstrup. Uh, Anderson, who's the H.E. Babcock Professor of Food and Nutrition and Public Policy at Cornell University. Uh, he's also a 2001 Food Prize Laureate. He'll be followed by uh, Dr. Francesco Branca, who's the Director of Department of Nutrition for Health and, Depo and Development at the World Health Organization. He was also formerly the head of uh, the European Nutrition Societies. Um, and then Dr. David Nabarro, who's a UN Special Representative on Food Security and Nutrition. Um, he'll wrap the session. Uh, as you all know, Dr. Nabarro was also formerly um, heading WHO's uh, campaign against the avian flu and malaria. Uh, Professor Pinstrup Anderson, your five minutes starts now. Okay, thank you very much. It's great to be here this morning. I'm going to talk about six key issues that I believe will influence the pathway from agriculture to nutrition and health. That's kind of what I was asked to talk about, to look at these pathways from the perspective of agriculture. The first key issue is the very large fluctuations that we have experienced in food production during the last few years and the resulting volatile food prices. And I believe that climate change is playing an important role in the fluctuations we're seeing in, uh, in food production, partly through the extreme weather events uh, resulting in droughts, in floods, in strong winds, and other damage to the crops. And those uh, fluctuations in production are, being, uh, are influencing food prices, food price volatility, but it's being amplified by a number of things, including uh, irrational expectations on the part of the speculators of the tr and the traders pushing up uh, prices of food beyond what is reasonable from a supply and demand perspective. Also, uh, government policies aimed at protecting domestic uh, consumers have pushed up the, uh, the uh, prices and increased price fluctuations and price, uh, price volatility. And the news media from time to time has over-dramatized uh, even small increases in food prices, arguing that that's the beginning of a long-term trend towards e ever-increasing food prices. Then when food prices come back down, uh, the news media is totally quiet. And so there is a problem here in terms of amplifying the price effects of some of these production fluctuations caused, I think, in part by climate change. The link to nutrition and food security, of course, is that with these large fluctuations in food prices, particularly low-income people who spend a lot of their income on food will be negatively affected. We see a dramatic increase in transitory food insecurity and malnutrition. The second issue that I want to bring up uh, is that even though the rates of population growth is decreasing worldwide, we will continue to see a, a very large, a very strong increase in the demand for food caused by, particularly by the diet transition. And the diet transition has at least two nutrition implications. One, many, in many cases, the transition in diet results in overweight, obesity, and chronic diseases. And so that's the bad side of the diet transition. The good side is that with a more diverse diet, you are likely to have a reduction in micronutrient deficiencies. Third item I want to bring up has to do with the management of natural resources. 
which we continue to do in a very unsustainable manner. And here I think the solution is a full costing, meaning that we have to add the costs of the damage we do to natural resources and to the climate. We have to add those costs to the private costs so that the consumers will pay the total cost and not just uh, part of the cost as they're doing right now. Um, now, in order to implement a full costing approach, we have to have international agreements, because if any one country does this, it will lose its competitiveness. So the fourth uh, uh, issue is the complacency that we've seen in the investment in agriculture and rural development up until the end of the century. Food prices were going down, everybody was happy, nobody was investing in agriculture. That's what we're paying for right now. There is some change in that with a lot of attention being given to increasing investment in uh, agriculture and rural development, but so far it's mostly words and promises, including the uh, promise of $20 billion to be allocated to agricultural development and food security improvement at the G8 meeting in Italy, um, uh, I believe it was last year or a year and a half ago. Very little of that money has, has yet forthcome. Fifth issue, um, we need to somehow decide whether the goal is to expand the pile of food in the world or the goal is to reduce food insecurity. Because depending on which goal we pick, and the two goals are not identical, we will have different policy interventions. And there is a tendency right now to focus on the total pile of food. We need to expand food production. Well, guess what? So many people have experienced a food crisis for so many years because they didn't have access. So unless we focus on access rather than production, we're not going to solve the food insecurity problems. This doesn't mean we shouldn't push for food production. Of course we should. I already mentioned that. The question is, who is going to produce the food? Time's up. Time is up. Can I just yes. make one final thing? Yeah. The, we need to incorporate the gender-specific issues when we talk about labor mm -hmm. demand and so on. And I have a few other things, and I'll come back to that. Thank okay. you. Dr. Branca. I'm too, way too close to you. <laughs> Thank you and good morning. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to see how many of you decided to wake up early in the morning to listen to, to us. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you. And uh, I really would like to start by giving some key figures to illustrate the magnitude uh, of the nutrition challenges we are facing. When uh, the MDGs were formulated in the 90s, we had uh, uh, 1.8 million poor people in the world. And now this number is down by 400 million. But then, in the 90s, we had 842 million hungry people, and now we're up to 1 billion people. So there's something which is not going in the right direction. In 2010, about 115 million children under five were underweight and under 86 were stunted. And every year we have 13 million children born with restricted growth or prematurely. We have anemia affecting half preschoolers, 42% of pregnant women. One third of the preschool children have also vitamin A deficiency. And overall, 2 billion people are affected by deficiency of micronutrients. And undernutrition overall is the cause of one in three deaths uh, from all diseases in children in uh, preschool years. And then maternal and child undernutrition combined account for 11% of the global burden of disease. So have we seen any improvement in the last 20 years? We, we actually have. And this has happened mainly in Asia with um, no progress or even deterioration in Africa. But now at the same time, and Per was already referring to it, we have as many as 1.7 billion people overweight, of whom 500 million are obese. And globally, we also have 43 million children under five who are obese. But the interesting thing is this is increasingly seen among poorer population in countries undergoing nutrition transition. 
And particularly if you see in the last 25 years, the, the uh, rate of uh, uh, overweight increase in preschool children and been, has been this, uh, steeper in uh, countries of, uh, of middle income. So this is ha happening in, in, in low and middle income countries particularly. Uh, the industrialization of the food chain, and Per was already referring to it, has changed the composition of the diet, which is much, uh, now much more energy dense. Uh, we have consumption patterns which are becoming similar throughout the world uh, with shifts towards high quality and more um, expensive foods such as meat and dairy products. Complex carbohydrates such as starches have uh, uh, decreased and sugars have increased 50 fold. And now we have up to 15% of energy intake coming from refined sugars. And the majority of it is hidden in foods uh, that are um, uh, processed rather than, than uh, added by the consumers. Fat content has increased from 20 to 40% in, in many countries. And this increase has particularly been uh, steady and rapid since the 90s. Salt, we now have 9 to 12 grams per day on average. Meat consumption has also grown remarkably from uh, 10 kilograms in the 60s to now we're expecting to have almost 40 kilograms in 2030. Milk and dairy also increased from 28 to projected 66 in 2030. Fruit and vegetables, global increase overall, but fairly flat in Africa. Nothing has been changing in the last few years. Really, the only thing that was driven by health concern was, was uh, fortifications. We have biofortification and addition of, of uh, uh, micronutrients to food, and that has become extremely, extremely common. Uh, but these trends are uh, not contributing to overall global health. We can say that overall changes in the food supply chain are responsible for an increase in the risk of uh, non-communicable diseases and overall uh, of the global burden of disease. So can we find new directions? And actually, uh, I believe that we can. New directions towards which orienting food supply chain could reduce the global burden of disease. We could replace uh, saturated fats and trans fats with polyunsaturated uh, vegetable oils, and this would lower coronary heart disease. We could reduce salt to the recommended le levels of five grams, and that would have a major impact on blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. We could increase fruit and vegetables and save 2.8 million lives. So we could pursue these goals uh, at different stages of the whole supply chain. And I really would like to mention just three. Primary production, we could select oil crops. Horticulture, uh, processing, we could reformulate products, put down trans fats, salt, refined sugar, uh, the use of ingredients like high fructose corn syrup, whole grain cereals. We could affect marketing and distribution. So in other words, and in conclusion, uh, we could uh, design health mindful supply goals, fat, carbohydrates, uh, micronutrients, and animal source food. And this alignment can pers be pursued. There are several tools to do that, uh, uh, which could be uh, going from negotiation for the, with the private sector to a lot of uh, tools that the government has to drive this supply. Thank you. Dr. When you're sitting here, you realize how short five minutes is. So, uh, and this is a very, very precious moment, a very important uh, event. And so I'd like to concentrate on three things. Firstly, a bit about myself. I write, really, I speak from the perspective of a medical person who worked for nearly 10 years on nutrition and development in Asia and Africa when younger, and I'm now an international bureaucrat focusing on trying to get some of the ideas that Per and Francesca have talked about actually put into practice in different settings. Secondly, a quick assessment on where I personally think we are, given the title, where are we headed and where do we want to be. Uh, we're in a world where hundreds of millions of people's functional capacity is impaired by poor nutrition and it is not due to an absolute lack of food or any kind of inability to produce the food that is necessary for good function and the fundamental problems relate to social policies and governance around food 
uh, and in some cases also the adoption of very bad policies. And we're not headed to a good place. We're in a situation where food systems are not working, where we've got nearly a billion hungry now, and as Per said, we have got to prepare for feeding nine billion by 2050. Uh, we're in a situation where smallholder farmers have not got secure livelihoods or at risk due to climate change, and where, uh, at, at least in my estimation, we may well be entering into another serious period because of rising food prices and food price volatility. We've got a lot of action underway. It, a lot of it, it also is extremely promising. New governance for food security, engagement of many bodies like the African Union and the European Union in ways that they haven't been for some years to come. But to take the links between agriculture, nutrition and health to scale, we have to do a lot more. And so here are five lines of, of action that I think that were worth looking at as we seek to get to the kind of places that my colleagues have identified during the last few minutes. Firstly, and obviously we have to make sense of the links between agriculture, food systems, diet, climate, environment, sustainability, and human well-being. And this requires utterly novel research, ways of thinking, ways of working. And then we have to incorporate that joined up thinking and action within our, within our work as bureaucrats, scientists, and decision makers. That's up to us, and the people in this room can do that. Secondly, we need to be working with others to make sure that the right policies are devised and implemented, policies that properly link to outcomes. Many of those that are being implemented right now do not do that. So that's a task that, again, we can be involved in, though we ourselves are often not making those policy decisions. Thirdly, a whole range of stakeholders need to be engaged in this thinking. And that's beginning to happen, but to involve a range of actors in both thinking and acting means also working with the people who are affected by poor nutrition and getting them part of the process in terms of analysis and operations. And to do that, we need to foster different kinds of organizational, uh, organizations in which we work, particularly movements that bring ranges of actors together on platforms that encourage common actions and results. These are not big organizations, large projects, new structures, new architecture. They're much more like Facebook and other social networks, and they can operate, and we've seen them work in numerous situations. That's how the world changes. Fourthly, obviously, actions and results, and to be able to demonstrate results is key. And fifth, we have to be able to communicate where it is we're headed. In case I got my numbering wrong, I will repeat them again. Firstly, making sense of the links and incorporating those links into our work. Secondly, getting the right policies. Third, engaging stakeholders and getting them to work in transformative ways. Fourthly, focusing on action and measuring results. And fifth, communicating and telling the story. And I think I may have got the order wrong. Perhaps the first thing should be to engage the stakeholders and establish the social movements, because that may well be the most important task ahead of us now. Thank you.